a little bit of a recap from last time. Last time we talked about the work of the Church Council. We talked about the basis of union and the governance principles that guide the Uniting Church and any Uniting Church congregation or um, agency. We talked about values and we talked about relationships and responsibilities of church councils. Today, we're going to look at what we can do to create a church council that works effectively, efficiently, and positively, with everyone contributing productively as much as possible. And I think we can all agree that that's a good thing to be aiming for. So when we work together, um, we are working in relationships. And um, last time we already talked about how important those relationships are when we're working, uh, when we're working as a church council. You can break the relationships down in, in three areas, a personal, a relational, and a more structural area. So there is the, the I, the individual, you and me uh, participating from our own um, point of view. Then there is the other, we meet in the relationships and there is a context that you, you, um, we share partly with the other and probably partly not. So there is an overlap between me and you, um, that purple bit here um, but there's also a lot I don't know about you and there's a lot you don't know about me that is outside that little triangle um, there's also the context there is part of the context that we share that we both know about when we relate to others but there is also a lot of context that is outside that awareness and some context that I have that you may not have and vice versa. Now they're right in the middle, that triangle, that's the sweet spot where we meet and where we are um, most effectively able to engage with each other because we can work from the same um, page as it were. Now that personal bit uh, when we come to a relationship, to a working church council, what we bring as individuals or what we need to bring as individuals, what is helpful to bring as individuals, is a bit of self-discipline, awareness of what's going on for ourselves and what may be going on for the other, uh, empathy, and allowing for differences. And that's about that being aware that I and you are not uh, the same. Respect is one of the ground um, things that we need to bring when we enter into a relationship. We all crave a sense of belonging. And it's good to remember that you may be craving a sense of belonging, but the people that you'll meet in that space are craving that same um, desire for belonging and an openness so to um, what may be going on for others and what may be happening in the context. Then there is the relational aspect of a church council where we need to think about the composition. So, for instance, if there's no overlap between the people in a church council, it becomes really hard to talk. Um, there's also something about, um, you know, numbers and stuff, but you'd, you'd need a little bit of overlap to be able to relate to each other. And it's good to think about that when you look for other people to join in your church council. You need relational skills when you enter into a relationship and working relationship like a church council and it's good sometimes to work on those if you feel that they could ha could have a uh, do with a little bit of work um, it's good to be proactive come in a proactive set of mind and be aware of participation not only your own that you make sure that you contribute 
but also that you make it possible for others to contribute um, and that you're mindful of creating space for them. Structurally, what happens to, what, what needs to happen or what can happen to make that whole uh, relational work of a church council um, work as optimally as possible. It's good to think about size. I've been on a church council with over 40 people. Um, that can um, give some challenges that are really not necessary when you cut down the numbers a bit the communication becomes a lot easier. Um, on the other hand, just two or three can be um, not enough. So um, I always think that Jesus with the 12 disciples probably um, had something um, going for him there. Um, thinking about the agenda, so preparing, like we talked about last time, preparing, thinking it through, um, not just plunging into the meeting, but carefully think about it. And perhaps also uh, that um, remember that consensus agenda we talked about um, can help with time, but also with creating space to talk about things that are in more important than some other things that may be on the agenda. Leadership is important. Um, the chair of the church council, but also, we are all leaders in church council. So we, we share that relationship and especially in the Uniting Church, um, that's one of, one of the things that we, um, we have in our um, basic um, convictions about how leadership work, works, that we, we share leadership in councils and we share leader, leadership as people. But having said that, in a in a, in a meeting, whoever chairs the meeting, it's imp important that they have the skill and the support to, to do that to the best of their abilities and in a helpful way. Timing is important. Um, that's with agenda setting, uh, thinking through beforehand what you talk about first and what you want to talk about later, and how much time you're going to allow for different things. But also uh, my rule of thumb is after 9.30 at night, um, usually that, you know, good, good uh, decisions aren't, aren't made um, after that time or after you've been together for more than two hours. It's probably the maximum. That's when we start getting tired and grumpy and um, accidents tend to happen in the communication and in decision making. Environment is also important. Not many uh, people stop to think about that, but the way you arrange your chairs um, or even the temperature uh, of the room, the lighting, all of these things um, are part of creating um, a space where it's, it's easy to, to talk and function. Contribution is a very uh, important thing, something to be aware of. Yesterday, somebody um, said, oh, sometimes we just go around the room and everybody gets a, a turn to say something. That's one way of making sure that everybody gets a chance. Some people need to think a little bit longer than others before they can jump in. So that's where it's important to get your reports and documents out beforehand. But also if there's something that's complex or difficult to just take five minutes, a five minute break, for instance, to um, allow for people to have that moment where they can get their um, head together and prepare for something to say. I'm one of those people that needs to scribble before I can actually say something in a meeting often. And um, yeah, where some people are just really good with jumping in, some others aren't, and it's good to, to take that into account when you come together as a church council. And last on this list, but not least, and maybe I should have put it at the top, the faith frame, being aware of what story we are all functioning in, and um, devotions, prayer, and Bible stories, Bible imagery um, is part of our vocabulary, but also of our toolkit. 
it adds to um, the way we function and it helps to um, support us through what we need to do as a church council. There's more, but this is just some of the things and maybe in the breakout rooms, you can come up with more just in a minute. So we put some helpful tools in your toolkit um, that may help you. The manual for meetings, which is not just the manual for meetings, but also got a lot of background information about how you go about organizing meetings, um, background information, context. So it's really worth going to that and having a look. Um, the code of conduct, which are the ground rules about how we, um, uh, the values according to which we interact with each other in the Uniting Church. And the code of conduct for lay people is something that Duncan is going to talk about um, later on. And then there are other behavioral covenants um, that are also worth considering. So that was my um, bit. First, the, the, an introduction into and a bit of thinking about, you know, what relationships are and how they function in our um, church council and what may be things that might be helpful. And we're asking you new, now to go into um, breakout rooms and talk about what you found helpful in building up participation in church council meetings and what helps you to have uh, conversations that are both generous and effective. And it's an opportunity to, to share, to ask questions, to see if you can find some new things or uh, to boast about some of the things that have worked for you and that may be helpful for others as well. Welcome back everybody. Now this is a chance for any uh, feedback, any questions or comments that have come through the conversation you've just had. And Annika will be taking your comments and questions. And the easy way to do that is to uh, unmute yourself if you want to have a, uh, a conversation. It's a bit like coming to the microphone and then you'll come to the top of our list. We can see who's wanting to talk. So if you'd like to uh, bring a question or a comment. In our group, we talked a bit about um, that people need, some people need time and that it's good to create room for those people to have that time so they can contribute more easily. All right, there's some people coming up now. James Douglas is at the top of my list. Uh, yes, I've got to, I, I, you, you can't shut me up really. Um, we, we were reflecting that, uh, that in fact, secure relationships amongst a church council, whilst yes, the too tight a knit, tight, too tight a knit church council can be hard to break into, uh, if, a, if, if, the, if the relationships between the church council members are, are secure, then they're also able to, uh, to better welcome people. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was a, an yeah. observation across a couple of us. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Jenny Mordlock, and before Jenny, you'd start talking, um, Jay just said you can also put questions in the chat. So if you want to do that, that's, that's, that's okay too. So Jenny. In our group, we had a couple of different suggestions that um, one group have uh, communion before each meeting, which gives everyone a, it starts them off the right way with their devotions and communion. And, the, and another group have a meal before every second meeting, which sort of gets people relaxed and in a nice frame of mind. So we thought that, well, I thought that was a good idea. So yeah. Thank you. That's that, that, that two very good ideas. Worth taking on board. Kay. Um, look, our, our groups all felt that we were very lucky that uh, the congregations know each other so well that church council runs smoothly because we have that friendship already and there's some respect for each other's opinions. And it's only hard if we're welcoming someone new that we have to be conscious of letting them feel that their opinion is important. Yeah, so yeah, two things there. Good to know each other, but also, you know, and we've said that before, be aware of when some, when new people come in that you make it easy for them and find ways to, to welcome them so they can participate. Janice. Because we are a combined church council with MFUC, 
our meetings are usually held on the Sunday where we have a combined service and a combined meal, then the meeting. So it follows on from what a lady two speakers ago said. We eat together and then we go and, and we have devotions at the start of the meeting, of course. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think our group basically felt the same. We're, we're all similar. We have good leadership and participate, and we have not the 12, more like six, seven, or eight in the group. Okay, yes. That's mm. Obviously, a lot of church councils do have smaller groups, yes. Mm. Anybody else want to make a comment? The, the, the comments um, that I'm about to put across is uh, getting the balance between those who uh, who might not be willing to, to talk in the council meeting and those who actually dominates. Yes. So getting the balance uh, sometime may be tricky. And True. And there's always got to be extroverts and introverts. Yeah. Uh, and the way we structure our, the way we hold our conversations is critical. So yes, we, it's not helpful just to tell people that who are extrovert to shut up, obviously. Uh, Obviously, Donald Trump is an extrovert, <clears throat> but uh, the, the, we need to be able to give space for people to reflect before they speak, because you know some people need that quiet and, and a chance to think themselves before they speak. So yes, sometimes it's, it's useful to have a pause uh, before someone speaks and, and then give that, that chance. And then the other part is that some, as I think Annika mentioned earlier, some people find it very difficult to speak unless they're invited particularly to speak. So that, that's the role of the chair is to actually say, well, okay, Paul, I'd like to hear what you have to say or uh, and so on. Okay, that's helpful, Paul. Thanks very much for that, that feedback. And Wendy, did you have something to say? Yeah, we found it very uh, helpful to have careful preparation that we knew in advance or have a report that we could think about um, so that when we come to the church council we've done a bit of prior thinking particularly about big issues and we can then share those ideas. Yes, that's, that's, a, that's and that's particularly helpful for introverts who need the time to go and do some thinking and reflecting and find it very difficult to cope when everybody else is just thinking on the, or speaking on the fly. So yes, that's really helpful tips there. And we'll, we'll come back to that later in the meet in today as well. Um, Duncan, if I yes. could jump in. Yep. Um, one of the comments that came up in our group, which I think is a really great comment, um, was that for those people where English may not be their first language, they might need to make sure we give them time to listen, to translate, and to form a response or, or an input. So again, um, you know, further to what Paul was saying and that idea of the church council chair, making sure that everyone has the space to respond and be part of the conversation. Yeah, that's true. And so having the confidence that we really understand what's happening here. And we'll talk about that in the next session in two weeks time in the consensus decision-making, the space for checking, making sure we have a clear understanding, the ability to ask questions, clarify what we mean by what we're saying. It's really important. I'm gonna jump in, I'm gonna jump in just before Duncan did. Um, one of the comments that came out, particularly in yesterday's session, which I have also reflected a little bit on overnight, um, it was talking about people who may not have English as a first language coming within a, uh, a church council and them needing just a little bit more time to, um, to process their answers and hear what's coming on. And what I did think overnight was it's not just people with English not as first language. It may be us who do not have the first language of the group who are meeting as well. So we need to be aware of our language differences and how that can take some time to process and give space for that. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Okay. Okay, over to you, Duncan. Thanks, Annika. Right, this next section is looking at two really helpful resources for us. One of them is the manual, well, is the uh, behavioral covenants and the other one is the code of conduct. 
So I'd just like to remind you that all these resources are on the website and I'll just take you there, just have a look. <clears throat> so you'll see uh, that up on the top there is the video from last weekend or two weeks ago where we uh, recorded our session. So you can go back and watch that. Uh, there's the book that we're using as a resource that has a lot of our, what we're talking about in there. The manual for meetings, this one here that, that uh, Annika referred to has quite a useful section. If you scroll down, you'll see there's a section on building community, uh, the skills and building communication and building relationship. And you'll let's scroll down there, let's have a look. Uh, all kinds of things about what we can do to grow what we're doing, making time for community, uh, rebuilding community. Sometimes we've been away or we've had a big Barney. How do we rebuild relationships, listening skills, assertion skills, conflict resolution, and so on. So there's lots of really useful material in there. In here also, we have the uh, a behavioral covenant. Here's an interesting one. Now this is uh, taken as an excerpt from a, a book we, we've found really helpful on behavioral covenants. And uh, you'll see here that that begins with our promises to God, our promises to our church family, and our promises to each other on the church council. So our promises to God are about our relationship with God and, and how that relates to our work in the world and in the church, listening, our promises to the church family about demonstrating leadership and commitment, supporting our staff, our ministry team, and discovering what's best for the church, and not just for us or our particular interest group. And finally, the promises to each other on the church council, where we, uh, we promise to make uh, a commitment to one another now, this is just a sample that's been taken out of a book as a resource, and you might want to uh, design your own behavioural covenant. And at the end, uh, what we suggest is that people actually read through it on a regular basis. And when you elect a new church council or put new members on the church council, you might want to revisit that and recite it, everyone together. So that's a really useful resource. And alongside that, there's a really helpful one for staff, particularly when you have teams working together. Uh, and, and Annika and I both have worked in ministry teams and we know how important it is that we find ways of committing to one another, making promises to each other about how we'll engage with the inevitable challenges that, that come from working in a team. So that's a really useful resource to have a look there. And then we have the code of uh, conduct for lay leaders. There's a plain version and a colorful one. Let's have a look at the colorful one. This was designed in 2016. It was, well, it was approved by the standing committee of the assembly for the whole of the Uniting Church. It's not well known, really. There hasn't been a lot of uh, work done uh, up to date. So we're really using this opportunity to introduce you to this code of conduct, not just one for, for ministers and other people who work in ministry. This one is for all people, members of congregations who provide leadership and not just those on church council. So there are a number of sections. The first one is an introduction about why we have this code of conduct. And uh, that's part of about our values, but also because we have had unhelpful behavior as well. Uh, so the first section here, leadership within the church, we are once again, a bit like that behavioral covenant, we are called to minister out of a relationship with God. And the way we do that is critical. Then the way we treat one another, all people in the church, including those engaged in church activities and programs with respect, courtesy, honesty, and fairness. And uh, then the way we uh, work with the legislative requirements and policies that relate to our particular area. And that includes at the moment, obviously, how we engage with the Victorian government 
the Department of Health and Social Services guidelines. That's part of our code of conduct as lay leaders. Uh, making decisions fairly, impartially and promptly, which means that we don't stall. We actually find ways of working through what's happening and how we make really careful and discerning decisions. Uh, being careful not to abuse any power that we might have, uh, and that includes uh, uh, physical power and spiritual power. And coming down here, modeling healthy relationships, avoiding abuse, including bullying. And bullying is defined as not just a one-off incident, but an ongoing uh, pattern of harassing others in a way that they feel harassed. So we may sometimes be surprised that our behavior might be seen as bullying. So these are really helpful things. The last one there in that list is being sensitive to the particular needs and vulnerability of children and young people. On Friday, we were uh, uh, yesterday, we were asked, so why children and young people are not people who are at the end of their lives or in their senior years who are also vulnerable? Well, in this case, it's because children and young people are usually not represented in our decision-making. They're not usually able to uh, stand to be on church council. So we need to be careful that we uh, pay attention to their particular needs and uh, the way that we treat them. There's a section on, section on confidentiality. And I remember uh, last time we talked about this a little bit around our values of transparency as well as confidentiality. And in particular, there's personal or sensitive information that is acquired through our work or involvement in the church. Other, and of course, other than required by law, and of course, if, you're, if you are aware of disclosure of sexual abuse, for example, we actually find, have to find a way of dealing with that, uh, speaking to the proper authorities. But there are other personal and sensitive information uh, that's, that's shared when we're in church council, that's it's only appropriate to share when we've agreed that it can be shared. So that's important for us to pay, pay attention to that. Uh, relationship with the law, and here's an interesting part, recognizing that the, there is a, a long-standing Christian tradition of political resistance and civil disobedience that may lead to exceptions. And the United Church in its, in its opening years, in fact, had to defy government bans on um, protest marches in some states, particularly Queensland, where people from the United Church led the way in the uh, civil rights and land rights for Aboriginal people. But we do make a commitment not to act violently or even to intentionally provoke in, uh, violence. We make a commitment to not to take property belonging to others, including intellectual property. And that's uh, an interesting one for us at the moment, where while we're in uh, restrictions, we're finding a challenge around how we share music on our, in our services. So if you want any advice on that, Craig Mitchell, our, uh, our colleague is very happy to talk you through the ways in which we can get engaged with that. Uh, goes without saying that we're not to make false, misleading or deceptive or defamatory statements. And that means not even little fibs, all right? So uh, little fibs lead to big fibs, which lead to being investigated for, for fraud and corruption, as we know in the, in the uh, news at the moment. Uh, and if you are being investigated for any criminal offenses, or you have any knowledge of serious criminal activity, you need to disclose that to the church leadership, uh, acting with financial integrity. And once again, in the news at the moment, it's, it, it takes a government down if you uh, don't have integrity in the way you engage with finances. And finally, here in this section, being responsible in our use of addictive substances and services. We can't take our hat off and say, well, I'm abusing alcohol or drugs in my non leadership time. And when I'm in the church council, that's leadership time. We are lay leaders the whole time. So we have to have some integrity. It's not banning alcohol or medications, but it's saying we need to be responsible. Conflict of interest. 
How do we ensure that uh, our personal or financial interests do not conflict with our church related roles and responsibilities? And that means being aware of when there are conflicts of interest. Uh, where, for example, if uh, you or someone you are related to, someone in your family is being employed by the church, it's helpful for you to be uh, stepping away from any decisions around their employment or their financial remuneration. And likewise, if, if you are uh, a member of the church council and you are related to the minister, for example, uh, in, in some issues you may need to say, well, I have to uh, step out of the room for this particular part of the meeting. And likewise, there are some times when uh, you know of something that's happened and you have to declare an interest, a personal interest. It may mean that you can stay in the conversation, but you need to be upfront about what you know or what you aren't able to sh share. Uh, and of course, that leads back to confidentiality. Uh, when the code is breached, this is an interesting one. We encourage people to, uh, to introduce the code of conduct at the very start of a church council's life when it's been elected and commissioned. So everybody is going through this together. There's no picking on one person and saying, right, this code of conduct's for you. No, it's for all of us. And so if you've been thinking about someone who's, for example, being abusive or bullying, uh, here's an opportunity to actually say, can we look at together as a whole church council uh, at our behavioral covenant and a code of conduct. So we'll all sign that together. And if there are some one-off cases, it's helpful to sit down with a person one-on-one, -on -one, not in front of anybody and bringing shame, but finding a way of sitting down with someone and talking through their behavior. But if there's ongoing behavior that's not responding to that feedback, then there are other ways in which we can talk this through. And uh, the presbytery is able to support you we can bring uh, support from a wider synod in terms of a mediation person who is not involved in the process. So that's part, a really helpful resource. So that's uh, the code of conduct. And I'm going to stop sharing and bring you back to uh, the questions that we have for today. Here's the questions. What are the benefits of using a behavioral covenant and code of conduct? So what would you see as a benefits? And some of you may have used one or been aware of the code of conduct and used it. And what would you do if members were not following the code of conduct? So that's a hypothetical, of course, but there's always gonna be cases where uh, we, we cross the line, where we find it, uh, in fact, I think I've got, there we are. When the code is breached, what do we do? So those are the questions. And I'm once again, I'm gonna put those questions in the, uh, in the, ch in the uh, chat and in the uh, questions for our breakout rooms. And once again, if, uh, if you want to speak at this point, you just need to unmute yourself and you'll come to the top of our list and we'll be able to take any comments and questions. Alan Easton. Yeah, I just wanted that one of the implicit things in a session like this is saying that we don't sometimes have to solve all the things in our own church council, that uh, there's great help from presbytery available as well. Yes. Uh, okay, that's helpful. Yes, the, uh, this, one of the signs of a healthy organisation or, or a healthy family or a healthy church council is the ability to be upfront or open with someone else about what's happening in your dynamics without shame. And uh, the presentry, uh, it's not just a, an organization that tells you how to do things, but also is there alongside you. And if you need someone to meet with your church council chair and secretary or uh, to come along to a church council meeting, we're always happy to do that. And I can tell you, people behave themselves really well when the presentry ministers are in the room. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the uh, yeah, we're, we're always help, ha happy to help, indeed. Yeah, Bill and Judy. Yeah, hi. Um, in our group, we we probably all agree that 
uh, it's been a really good refresher for a lot of us. A lot of it is uh, common knowledge and common sense, but it's made us all probably just rethink the situation. And also I think in the last probably 15 years or so, the way Presbytery would deal with conflict in a congregation now is probably different to what they did maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, that's what perhaps we have, well, in our situation, yeah, we've had different things and I'm sure now Presbytery would deal with them differently. But, yes. um, well, we, we're all on a learning curve. That's, yeah, exactly. Yes. So things have changed and I think this talking about it today has just brought it back probably to everybody that um, we know Presbytery is there to help us if we if we need it. And, yeah, I think it's been really good. That's great. Thanks for that, Judy. And Kelly. I'm dobbing in Nari from our group purely because uh, she brought up a good point that our, um, our code of conduct is not a, for reprimanding of everybody else, but it's for a space of self-reflection on our own actions. And I was like, oh, I'm like, that's really powerful. So I thought I'd share it, but she had a really good point on that. Yeah, that's really helpful. And that brings us back to the prayer of St. Francis that we had at the beginning, which we'll close with at the end as well. And Lynette. Um, I, I, I'm going to pick up, I guess, what Bill and Judy uh, said, how it's different these days and applaud um, the fact there is a code of conduct and uh, a behavioural covenant now, um, knowing that in the past there wasn't a lot of support for ministers in these situations. Um, also uh, in our group, James raised the possibility, because I've, I've certainly had situations in the past where presbytery people have been available, they've been on holidays or whatever, and the Bethel Centre was mentioned. And I think that's worth mentioning too, that if there is a real issue and you need support um, to go there, or because I, the issue I raised is when these things are intense, you need help fairly quickly. Yes. And to be able to um, have resources that you can go to quickly is, is really helpful. Mm. That's really helpful, Lynette. Uh, yes, and Annika has had some really uh, close contacts with the Bethel Centre in the past and continues with that support. So maybe we'll uh, put their contact details on the page that we've provided as a resource for you and remind you that, that the Bethel Centre provides support for individuals, for teams, as well as for communities. So that's a really important uh, point. Thanks very much, Lynette. And Al, um, is it Mark next? Yeah. Uh, hi. If a church council member has a problem and can't get it resolved, is it ethical to go to the Presbyterian minister without informing the rest of the council? You, okay. Well, it does happen. Yes. Uh, okay. yes. <laughs> but the... Um, sometimes people, someone will ring up the, the press uh, like Annika or myself or, or Craig and, and uh, or Ian first, the secretary, just to get some advice. How do I handle this? What do I do? Uh, which is fine. Uh, we'd, but we'd, we like to encourage people to have those conversations locally, as, you know, to actually talk to each other about what's happening. And that's what we always say, go back and have a good conversation about what's going on, if you can. In some cases, there are people feel threatened by the behaviour of somebody else and find it very difficult to approach a person who is bullying them. So that's where someone might find it really helpful to have support from outside the, the church council or the congregation. All right, so... Uh, Yep, the, the principles that Jesus talks about of of one on one, three three people going and, and having a conversation, and then the whole community, those are what we would like to work with. But the presentry here, uh, where where there is a support for you to help work through those principles. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. So I've got uh, Andrea. In, in our group, <coughs> it was uh, suggested that. In, a, in any group, there's some person, <coughs> pardon me, that's difficult yes. and someone that generally uh, throws in red herrings 
and, and the suggestion was made that perhaps we need those people so there's some growth in the in the group rather than everybody just coming along to agree and have a nice cup of tea. True, that's right. So if we were all the same, and uh, it, it would be rather dull, wouldn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. So part of that is is self awareness for those people, isn't it? So they're, they're aware that they're unlikely uh, to take a contrary view. Uh, Sometimes it's actually useful to say, okay, right, for a contrary view, for a different point of, point of view, can we hear from Paul now? Yeah, so, or, but, but at the same time, there's no excuse for abuse. Yeah, so that's, that's part of the issues that we're facing, isn't it? Uh, Paul and then Jill. Paul uh, just one of the things that uh, came up uh, a few times was the importance of having in the first instance, if there's inappropriate behaviour or response to something, one-on-one -on -one conversations is the first step is very important and you usually gets a good response compared to uh, broadcast conversations being the worst case. Indeed, that's right. And, and I've found that uh, taking it offline, I need to talk to you about this afterwards uh, because otherwise there's a strong element of shame and people don't, people are not motivated by shame generally. They're, they're motivated by, I believe that you could do this better. Uh, so but it can be a shock for some people to, to be confronted by their behavior, uh, but it's important to do that in a way that's, that's gentle, but firm. Yeah. Uh, Jill? Uh, one thing that came up in our group, apart from that first one-on-one -on -one conversation was if it was a continuing breach that was proving hard to deal with was that you can get mediation assistance um, from Synod, I think Patricia said. Uh, heaven help us from having to go to that level, but sometimes it could happen. Yes, and there are churches around that have, had that, that have used that, and it's been really helpful uh, because a, a prolonged conflict can hold a church back no end. Uh, and one of the difficulties is if the minister or the chair of the church council is being targeted by a bully, uh, you're, you're in, in strife. So you need to have someone else who can come in from the outside. Uh, so on, in the first instance, you're welcome to approach the presbytery team to get some advice. And we would be able to help you find someone who could uh, na navigate those difficult issues. Uh, Jenny. Um, it came up in our group, it was, I thought was really helpful, was um, once we've made the code of conduct, which our church doesn't have, which I would like to start the conversation, and there's a few of us who want to do that. Yeah. Um, when you have a new council, each time it's elected, every council assigns it. Because I just thought, well, there's one thing just having the, the code of conduct there, but mm. everyone signed it, then they've got a, a better awareness of what it contains. That's true. And I think the benefit of when you bring a new person onto the church council, everybody signs it again. It means it's fresh in their, our memories. It's not something we signed five years ago. It's something that we signed this year. And that's part, and, and uh, it's linked with the, I, I mentioned the covenant at the beginning. So it's not just a code, but it's a covenant, it's agreement. And uh, the covenant service that's provided in the Uniting Church and Worship too, is worth exploring as a as a uh, resource for worship, as well as for church councils. Okay, any other questions, Kelly? Um, I'm just going to repeat Margaret's question that was in our group. Sorry for dropping you in, but um, the question was: um, Is there any like re like I suppose code of conduct for married couples on church councils um, and things that happen there? That grin was great, but yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, thank you for raising that. And uh, we will talk about that next week in some ways in terms of discerning who should be on church council and whether they should be together. Uh, there's nothing written down anywhere about saying to married couples uh, or people who are partners can't be uh, on church council. But yes, the conflict of interest and the recognition of 
the ethical challenges around um, power, for example. So if 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 two people who are thinking alike and are able to uh, conference together come as a block on a church council, that becomes quite an issue. And uh, in particular, if one of those people add to that uh, is the treasurer or the secretary or the chair, then you have to pay more attention to the dynamics. And if you have one person who's a treasurer and the other person is employed by the congregation, then you're really having to think again about who's taking those roles. Uh, so, yes, thanks for that, Kelly. It's, it's a, um, it can be a minefield. And, and I do encourage church councils to avoid uh, married couples sharing the most significant uh, office bearer roles like treasurer and secretary uh, or uh, chair and secretary. Okay, uh, Ron? Uh, just uh, from our experience at High Street Road, we've had a married couple on our accounts for 20 years and uh, they haven't held the uh, positions you're talking about, but they've been a very, very, very helpful and working with the code of conduct strictly. They, they've been fantastic. So. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> they can work really well. That's right. So uh, the code of conduct really is to provide us with the the guiding lane so we know when we cross the line. And uh, in general, we're able to work uh, healthily. That's, that's, that's our hope. Okay, now Craig is going to help us look at how we build a learning culture in our church councils. And uh, welcome, Craig. Thanks, Duncan. It's good to be here. So when I did my when I did my doctoral research, I visited 21 churches around Australia um, that were seen to be effective, um, broadly speaking, in in growing disciples in faith formation and education. And I studied them uh, through interviews, and I came away with this way of thinking about the church as a learning community. Um, so what's a Learning means growing. It doesn't mean going to school. It's the ways in which we grow. So what do people learn in the church? And I guess I want to boil it down to two things, that we learn about discipleship and we learn about mission. So we learn about our learning is about growing in faith and it's about being God's people in the world. So um, congregations that, that are growing in faith focus on that, those two ways of learning. So you'll see learning community there, which is the lens of thinking about a church as a group of people who were learning and growing in faith. Learning practices is about learning the practices of discipleship. So there's a focus on learning what disciples do. Learning mission means that we are people who learn for mission, in mission and from mission. I could talk a, a lot about each of these, but I'm just skating you through it. And the last one is the one we're touching on today that, um, a learning congregation has leaders who are learning. Um, and that includes the minister and the church council and people in key leadership. And that means several things. And just to say it briefly, uh, it, means, it means leaders who have a culture and who give time and attention, um, firstly, to growing as a team. Secondly, to um, growing in their relationship with God. Um, Thirdly, in um, learning about leading, so learning about leadership, and fourthly, that they're actually learning about um, learning about how to help the congregation be a learning community. Um, that would take a bit more unpacking that one. But so and so, what we want to do today is to I'm going to show you a bit of um, one of the interviews that I did, where a particular minister talks about. Uh, learning with his church council. So I took um, several stories about this. Um, the one, one, one that you're not going to see is the Queenscliff Point Lonsdale congregation, uh, where every second church council meeting for them was not about business, it was about learning together. Every second church council meeting. And you'll go, well, how do they get the business done? Well, that's a story. Um, but this one, so this is Reverend Ian Hickenbotham, who was at North Ringwood Uniting Church, 
um, and some of you will know that and some of you will know Ian. And he talks about when he first came to North Ringwood, which is probably 15 years ago now. Um, he's now retired. And he talks about um, the church council. So let's listen to that for about four minutes. <laughs> first came, um, structure here was not healthy, was not functional, in that I go to my first church council and they said I will give you a time to speak. Now it's after about 11.15pm, they give me a time to speak. I thought this is crazy. They were grinding through on doing micromanagement, that's what they were doing. So we had to shape that. And at second church... I then said, right, our next church council, I'm taking you out. And I, I took them to the IMAX theatre in Melbourne mm -hmm. and we watched Shackleton of the Antarctic as a study in leadership. Yeah. We watched it. I took them outside. We had coffees outside and we sat around on those, around outside and we had a conversation of what are the principles of leadership we've just witnessed and we discussed it. And then I remember I picked up a stick and in the gravel I drew a model. I said, I drew a pyramid right? mm -hmm. with the congregation at the bottom and the presbytery and synod and assembly at the top. Okay? In the dirt. And I said, now, get up and walk around the other side. And it, that then inverted the pyramid. And the congregation was at the top and presbytery and synod and assembly, which are the supports. And I said, we as leaders are supporting the congregation. We are not above them, telling them what to do. They're on the dance floor. Our job is to support. That's what a leader is. So that was, our, that was my second church council here. Occasionally I've taken them out. I took them out one night to a theological lecture. I said, we shouldn't just meet to discuss stuff here in these four walls, we should go out. Mm. When I was in Melton, I had a mystery night for the elders one night. I hired a bus, took them into the city, mm. took them up the top of the Rialto, and we had our elders meeting in the observation deck of the Rialto Tower, right? Mm. And I said, now, look out. What do you see? Compare that with when you're on street level, what you saw there said leaders have to go up and look out and see where the roads go and where the river runs. At that time the casino was meeting in the, um, their older facilities there. I said look at the car park there, it's full of people. Why are people flocking to the casino? That was our elders meeting that night, mm. discussing these things. That's leadership. My role then is maybe creating some other opportunities for to take people out of the four walls where they always think the same way, yeah. take them into a different environment where they'll think differently. Mm -hmm. I said, I want you to start to think as leaders. I said to them in the first instance, you have been elected, see, you are in positional leadership. But positional leadership doesn't actually mean much these days. Um, I want to teach you about qualities of leadership, mm -hmm. principles of leadership. Mm -hmm. And of course, I take them up to the Rialto, there's the illustration. Yeah. Look down. That's what leaders do. Leaders do. And then we all, we, all, we went out for supper after that. And it's a buzz. The talk was fantastic. Yeah. The principles, they, they, they're seeing things now. It's connecting. And the drive home on the bus, I had them all in the bus together, not in separate cars. Yak, 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 yak. Terrific conversation. Okay. Are we ready for some conversation around being a learning community as church councils? Have you got any stories about what you've done to, to learn as a, as a church council? What, what are the things that you think that this might spark for you in at your conversation? Yes, Wendy. I'd like to hear how others are, tr 
um, attract people to um, stand for church council? That's a great question. And, and we're going to cover that in quite a little, lot of detail in the next two, in two weeks' time. But uh, in a very short way of, uh, of addressing what we're going to talk about, the first one is to ensure that the people who are currently on church council are actually enjoying themselves. Uh, so there's nothing worse than people coming off and saying, well, I spent three years on church council and I'll never do that ever again. That puts people off. You, know, you get a reputation for being a horrible place. But we want to have a place where people say, that was enriching. I found as though God was using my gifts. And uh, I really encourage you to think about using your gifts on the church council. So that's, that's part of what we're going to talk about in two weeks' time uh, as well. There's a few other things we'll talk about then. And Duncan, I think part of being, part of that learning culture thing is, Ian talked about his council being energised. Yes. You know, so, so uh, do people talk about their experience with the council in a way that's, that's people don't, people, some people get energised by business, but some don't. So you don't just get energised by doing business, you actually get energised by doing other stuff as well. Yes. It might be a retreat, uh, might be some learning stuff, spiritual um, input. Come, uh, Kelly? Um, I want to know about a question about devotions. Like, like I know that we do a devotion at the start of our church council, like a lot of meetings do. Um, and I've had some really good ones. I know, Alison, I'm going to dub you in here. Alison wants to pass the parcel for our devotion and have little verses in each one. It was amazing and fun and great. Um, but I just want to know, like, uh, uh, should we be discussing particular things or how do we theologically reflect on what we should be discussing as team and things like that? Um, Duncan, can I dive in? Because it yeah, relates to. It. Yeah. Um, so when I was chairing uh, church council at church in Adelaide, um, they were rotating devotions, and frankly, it, it just felt like you had to have a turn. You had to think of something. Like it just wasn't that great. It was kind of let's fill in the first five minutes, and I, I basically said, "We're going to take twenty minutes. We're going to make this. We're going to learn about something, and then we're going to then we're going to pray. So we're actually going to." Um, have a block of time each time where you're introduced to some thought, idea, model, whatever it is, and and our prayer will come out of that. So so I actually took it back so that we could um, not just have a token thing to start, but focus on something. And there's I mean, it's more more than ways to do it, but I'd encourage people to not do a token devotional thing. Yeah, I was just thinking um, things. Something I've done that worked really well was um, taking. Well, me as the minister taking responsibility, but sharing it with different people every time. So then you get all the voices, but you don't give it to somebody to wrestle with on their own and try to find time. And you can then also connect it with the themes and the, 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 the topics that you're discussing or that are playing out in the congregation or in the world or, and I think then, you know, you can, you can get different flavors from different people, but at the same time, um, you can, you can help each other to, to really provide quality. And it became something that people were looking forward to. Uh, I want to say thank you to Craig. Uh, I think you've jumped on something really important for me here that, the church, I think, in the community has a, an image of being passive, certainly caring and gentle, maybe, uh, but to be energetic and, and arguing and engaging in life is, is something that I think we need to have for all of our churches to sort of stir up the congregation and as a church council and hopefully then into the world in a, in a more energetic way. Yes. So that sense of the church council being a microcosm of the church as the, of the congregation mm -hmm. as a whole. We were, we're definitely wanting to be that, have a, uh, a growth and, and enrichment happening there that, that spreads out, that's for sure. Do you want to say any more about that, Craig? I, I think one thing we heard from Ian was, was a kind of a catalyst thing. You know, he did, th he, he, he did things with his council that provoked something. 
So, you know, stirred people up a bit, made them think differently, gave them a new experience, took them to a new location. Uh, not just sitting around a table, you know, same table every month, going through the same stuff. Um, so there's something there about variety of experience, I think, Vivian, that combines with real life, you know. I think, and Ian's thing of, I wanted to get, get them outside the walls of the church to think about the world. I think, you know, it's a um, great example, the ways he did that. Yeah. And learning is active rather than passive thing. Once yeah. you start people thinking and, and talking and arguing. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Vivian. That's great. And, and I'm sure you've got a lot to offer in that space. Nick, let's hear from you, Nick. No, there's probably not time for this um, to be discussed at great length, but I wonder what people think of the idea of having a, a cap on our time on council, three to five years, and then we, 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 we compulsorily retire ourselves. I know... I know, um, you know, there, there are wider issues about, well, who, who replaces us? Uh, do we have the numbers to regenerate like that? But uh, it's used in a lot of organisations, three to five years, then you compulsorily retire from that position. I wonder what people think of that. Yeah, that's an interesting one, Nick. Uh, certainly, uh, the gap year approach rather than retirement might be a way of approaching that. Fiona, do you want to say something about that? That's what I was going to say, if we all retired after three to five years, there'd be no one left after 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, like, so I, like, I really like the gap year idea that, um, that Di mentioned last, last time, though. Yes, that's great. Yeah, so you take a year off and um, go generous. see the world for a while, yep, and, and come back refreshed, yes. Any other thoughts on that idea of ensuring that we uh, get a rest or get a sense of other people coming in? It's, it's uh, a bit easier when you've got a, a, a larger congregation, but when, you, when you're struggling to even get six people on church council, that can be a challenge, can't it? Yeah. Um, and, yeah. yeah uh, when I was on church council and also when I was an elder, um, at the end of my term of office, I stepped down because if you continue to be rolled into church council or eldership, nobody else will, will consider putting their hands up because that's okay, it's already full. Hmm. And and so it's really, I, I believe it's really important to have that, as you said, gap year, where people can step back, allow somebody else to step up and, and bring new people in and new ideas in. Yeah. And the good thing about a gap year is you're not just taking a year off, you're actually going and getting some new experiences which is a great idea. Uh, okay, Nicole? Oh, yeah, I was just going to echo what um, Di just said, that, like, sometimes being having a vacancy encourages people to fill that vacancy. Like, if you're just constantly filling it because you don't think anyone else is going to do it, then people don't actually have the opportunity to step up and to take on a role. Um, and if the, if the role's always full, whereas if you have a gap year, it gives opportunity for new people to, to have mm. a try um, and to do things. And particularly younger people who, yeah. who are coming into positions. Okay, two more, two more comments from Julie and then Wendy. Um, how do you encourage people that have been on council since day dot to actually take that gap year because they think that they are so um, indispensable? How do you encourage them to move aside to let someone else in. I reckon you give them an iPad. You know, like you have it, you have, like when you get the gold watch when you retire, you have a very, like a great gift and people go, oh, I need one of them. And I get a year off. Incentive, wow. incentive, that's the thing. And you probably give them a year's subscription to Netflix uh, or something as well. Yeah, 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 that, yeah that's right. Go, it, go and watch some TV. Yeah, but I think it actually, uh, and look, acknowledgement of, of years of service and uh, celebrating that. It's a really important thing to do. Uh, and uh, then people get a sense, well, I, I, my time here has been really valuable and it's not wasted. Wendy. Yeah, I was, uh, mentioned succession planning earlier, particularly for our office bearers. You know, that yes. uh, things like treasurers, as we said, yes. um, unless people have opportunity to um, apprentice you know intern in the roles it's very hard to switch into new office bearers in in church councils at times mm -hmm. that's true and it's and it's easier uh, i mean i would say 
like I know how hard it is to recruit people, but, but I would say even in a smaller church, it's easier to get people to be on a small team than, as you're saying, when you then to step in, you know. It's mm. um, really, really, we know how hard it is to get someone to take on church treasurer or secretary because mm. it's just a huge job. Uh, to say, well, look, we've got a finance team of three people, one of whom's the treasurer, and the, and the other two are learning along the way. Um, and they don't have to be doing everything, but, yeah, sharing. And I've... Mm. Yeah, anyway. And, and Nicole points out that the regulations do say that, that after five years, you, need to be, you would need to be re-elected. And, I would, and we'll talk about this in two weeks' time, uh, that you don't just get re-elected, you actually also need to go through a discernment process with the congregation uh, and so on. Um, Duncan, I just thought I'd state an obvious something that in this life of Zoom, we've lost that opportunity to gather around a table together and share and learn and the insights that we can gather from those casual conversations are almost as important as the business conversations that we make. Um, and so I think the challenge is that we always need to be thinking, but that sits at the back, that we're still missing, even though we've got faces, we're missing the connections. That's true. So there are some limitations, but there are also opportunities. So you, you heard about uh, the, uh, the t taking a church council for a trip to the city in a bus. Imagine the hassles about organising the budget for that and getting all of that organised. But uh, now we can actually uh, all go to a seminar online together and then have a conversation about it afterwards. It's, uh, we can go to a theological lecture. We can we, we can go to the opera or whatever you want to do. And uh, the the possible well, not an opera in the person, but obviously other other ways of doing things. Now, James, you're next. Oh uh, yes, thanks, Duncan. I was I was going to say that I um. Yes, I think I, I said in my last, in an email to you after our last session that it was both uh, challenging and inspiring. And that, that last bit was the challenging bit um, because uh, as much as I would like to say that I, 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 you know, I'm an educational, uh, I, I find education important, I suspect that um, my church council members would not say, oh, well, yes, we learn something new every church council or every second church council or anything like that. Um, and while I don't bear sole responsibility for the church council, um, I, I'm conscious that yeah, that that's that's something we haven't done as much of in in the last sort of six years. So uh, I'm 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 kind of inspired and challenged and trying to get work work through the whole. Oh, I should have been doing that thing and okay. uh, work okay. through into uh, yes. A good We've reminder. Got some and watch out, St Luke's Mount Waverley. That's exactly but, it. Exactly right. But uh, it's a good point, uh, James, that the role of minister in a church council is, is helpful in terms of leading uh, learning, but also we may found, find other people in the church council have a gift and calling in that area. And I'd love to see uh, each of our congregations has a person who is a contact for us around lifelong learning. So that might be something to consider who's actually keeping an eye out for the possibilities for encouraging learning in the congregation. And we have Tony and Jenny, Jenny or Tony, Duncan. Uh, it's Tony this time, surprisingly. Uh, I, I'm a great believer in, in, in retreats and uh, in all the congregations I've been in, uh, we've, we've had retreats and, and, and it's, that the spiritual aspect of that is is really important, and the learnings that are done during that. I I worked with Ian for a while uh, when he was at Melton, and I have to say that uh, I learned a lot from him, and I've introduced some of his practices. So I, I think it's possible to 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 do that, and and j just to say, to, uh, there will be life after COVID. Uh, there will be after lockdown. We will be let out, and those are the times that we can also be face to face, uh, thinking yes. of what we can do. But the, the important thing about a, a, a retreat was that we used to go out into the bush and do the retreat there. And uh, there were leaders. You're talking about different leaders uh, using the talent that you have on your church council. That that's very important because. It's, it's not the minister's job to do everything. You'll be pleased to know. 
<laughs> That's great. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> I just leave that. Yes. Okay. Uh, Lynette. Lynette. Um, then... I, I, I'm probably following on with what Tony said, but I'm thinking of the, the phrase, a change is as good as a holiday. Um, basically, what I really loved about what Ian just said is the ability to see things from a different vantage point, which is about learning and teaching. And some of my best teachers have done that. Um, and the last thing I can think about is the Dead Poets Society one when Robin uh, gets up on the desk and, and teaches from um, that vantage point. So I think if we as, as church council can just look at things differently or go to a different space and see it. So that image of looking down from the Rialto Tower I really like. So I just want to say there's a bit of excitement around seeing things differently and changing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, yep. I love Robin. Yep. Uh, have we got Sandra next? Oh, um, yeah. 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 Sandra, yeah. Oh. Yes, I love that idea of uh, my off mute. Yeah. I love that idea of um, doing something different. And uh, I also think retreats are great, but it always seems to be, you know, someone can't come on that weekend or that evening or no one can get there. The church council is sort of a commitment and most people put it as a pretty strong commitment and we get most people there. And so it's lovely to think, well, one night when we're all coming there, we're all just going to zip out somewhere else or someone's going to do up a different room or we're going to have a dance or I don't know, whatever is a wonderful concept and it's not as difficult. As you said, you can hook in and say, well, we're going to watch this tonight, for, you know, instead of the council meeting. I think it's a really exciting idea. Very good. Alan and then Tom. Yeah, I just wanted to say that over the years, we've had a variety of uh, excellent experiences visiting other churches. Uh, sometimes it's been for a worship service, sometimes it's been for a weekend, and sometimes it's just visiting to see what they're doing in their uh, outreach. And uh, that's been great for the people visiting, but also for the people who have been visited. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. Thank you very much. Tom? I just briefly comment on two things, Duncan. James is uh, underestimating his teaching ability. He's encouraged uh, St. Luke's to be a learning congregation. So not only does the church council should be a lifelong learning, but the congregation needs to have learning activities. And I think that's an important part of, of this. Secondly, I, I, I think that it's fair to say that your leadership of the presbytery has uh, helped the standing committee and the presbytery and council to be much more learning groups than they, they have been previously. So I think we need to develop that further. Yes, yeah, so well, that's a, a team thing. And uh, Annika, Craig and I, we have a very strong commitment to fostering a learning community. Uh, we've got uh, Sodi Sim and uh, Han. Duncan, we also have Robin, who's had her hand up for quite oh, a while. Oh, right. Okay. So, Robin, you just need to unmute yourself there. Yes. I, am uh, I, think, okay. I think from my uh, uh, experience, I'm so grateful that I uh, belong to the Church Council at uh, Glenwell for Reuniting Church because uh, they are uh, not, uh, they are not too, maybe several, uh, who are uh, very good in teaching and nurturing, uh, uh, teaching leadership, uh, creating uh, activities along the way. Uh, so we, uh, other than meeting, we also have that uh, activities, but not necessarily going out. We have the activities um, uh, uh, in the venue. Uh, uh, yeah, I just want to be to say that I'm grateful. Uh, as you see, I'm not uh, uh, I'm one of the uh, person or members from a different culture, but uh, I'm grateful that I can have this opportunity to learn from uh, the other uh, church counselors. Yes, thank you for that. I will take Robin next. I, I, you're at a, on a different part of my list, so now I see you there, Robin. So That's okay, Duncan. Um, I just wanted to say that Ormond Uniting, a number of years ago, committed as a congregation and as a church council to be a congregation of lifelong learning. 
And one of the things I thought I'd share with you that we did have done, it wasn't going to be throughout COVID, but we've done it through Zoom. We actually embarked in a, on a theology course and conducted, I think there was 15, 16 of us, um, not only church council members, but members of the congregation. And we completed, I think it was a 13 week theology course. Yes, that's great. And that was through Pilgrim Theological College, was it? It was, but actually one of our members led it, who's got a master's in theology. Yes. So that's where we're really encouraging congregations to think about being hubs of learning, yep. supported by, by the ELM, by Pilgrim and our lay education team. I, yes. And I can't actually remember, Gary Richter might remember who it was through, but um, yep. it was through the Uniting Church. It was, we did one of their first um, mm -hmm. uh, modules um, and it was fantastic. It was yes. just a way of coming together, starting to look back at the basis of union, looking at creation, looking at all sorts of things. So um, yes. that's just something we've done in terms of our. Yeah, we told the story in Newsbeat a wee while ago and Mel Perkins was the key person around that. That's right, yes. Yes. Uh, Hans, and this is the last uh, comment question before we finish off for today. Sure, I just wanted to observe, I guess, that there's 75 of us, there's something really intriguing about what we could do. Um, I know that there's a sense that somehow things will go back to normal <coughs> after COVID, but I, I wonder whether there, I wonder to what extent that will be true. And, I, and I, what comes to mind for me is that we may end up with a more a blended approach to working with each other that will include online as well as um, as well as face to face. And one of the 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 uh, one of the things I guess I want to share with you is that there are ways of improving that online collaboration. Um, and and it's something to do with I think what you Duncan I think you, you reminded me of that the difficulty is findability. How do you make yourself findable? How do we know what, what skills and pieces of the puzzles and solutions and contributions and curiosities we have? And that's a, that's a challenge that um, in the commercial arena, people are extremely good at. So people are extremely good at finding a driver or a market. And we're okay in universities and finding other researchers. But one of the issues, the challenges I think we have uh, about um, a better leveraging of all these curiosities and interest and skills and needs amongst hundreds of, of, um, of potential participants is, is that uh, it would require uh, us to become, make ourselves more findable. Yes. And that is to share more data about what our skills <laughs> are at a, at a larger scale. Now, I'm hesitant to share this because it's such a large it's, it's, it's systemic and it's challenging, but I just want to plant a seed that it is possible to leverage what's called, what I coin as engineering serendipity, that it is serendipitous that we go into a, a breakout group and we find a connection, but you could scale that up if you shared, if we had a, a, a more collective approach to improving our findability. Um, and, and that's, I guess, something about that innovation that, um, that's happening in, uh, in, in IT that's being monetized heavily, but not leveraged adequately, I think, within, within um, uh, groups such as, such as this. So if we can get that findability, we need to open ourselves up as to what about receiving. Before we can learn, we have to be coachable first before we can start to impart our knowledge and our skills and our love onto others, but we've got to be vulnerable first. So we need to potentially put that out first, that we're open for, you know, input from, you know, to get that findability. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, Bella Judy again. Well, I think we, we, we could all change, couldn't we, some stage? That's, that's true. As we think we've already made it, that's... Uh, yeah, that's, that's a problem. So being able to find a way of, of encouraging lifelong learning as our culture begins in our church council. And uh, part of Craig's research was focusing on the connection between leadership and being able to be in mission in our current environment. 
So the work of a church council in modeling that is critical. Mm. So look, thank you very much for everybody's comments. And look, the fact that we're here in the room together and hearing each other, we're finding each other through this process. So uh, <coughs> we're very keen as a presbytery to keep that interconnectedness going and to share what we're learning together. We're going to finish off with just a, a very brief reflection back on what we've done here today and a prayer. So just think back to how we've started today. We, we began with the focus on building relationships. And that's a reminder that relationships are at the heart of who we are and how we operate. <coughs> so thank you very much, Annika. We, we talked about the boundaries put around that help us keep those relationships functioning healthily but the boundaries are not the focus. They are just the way we keep ourselves in, this, in the same direction. And we finished off with a sense of learning together as a community. And part of what we've experienced today is that there's a lot we can do together in one large room with, with one person speaking and that all of us listening. And that's part of that's inspiring and so on. But, but the critical part of what we've done today has been in our breakout rooms where we've been able to reflect and uh, share insights and grow together. So thank you for being part of this learning community today. And we want to encourage you uh, to come back in two weeks time when we're going to be discussing the ways in which we make decisions and how we uh, discern together the ways in which we select church leaders, which includes putting people on church council but other roles as well in the church. I want to finish off with a prayer from the prayer of St. Francis, coming back to the prayer we had at the beginning before we started. Presence of divine love, open my life, let your peace may flow through. Where there is fear, let me learn to trust. Where there is apathy, let me bring hope. Where there is slander, let me speak kindly. Where there is wrongdoing, let me show mercy. Where there is prejudice, let me show welcome. Where there is injustice, let me work for freedom. Where there is cynicism, let me bring vision. Where there is suffering, let me bring comfort. O oh, living one, may I seek to be more grateful than to grasp, to love the world more than have the world love me, to follow the call in my heart more than follow the crowd. For it is because I am loved that I can love, because I have been forgiven that I can forgive because I need your blessing more than I can bless. Open my life, that your peace may flow through this day and always. Amen. And that prayer is from the Celtic Wheel of the Year by Tess Ward. So thank you everybody for coming today and remember to uh, catch up with the resources that we put on the, the website that we put in the email uh, and let us know if there's anything else that you'd like support with or encouragement with any other resources that you'd like to be catching up with. God's strength and love be with you today.